All right. Good afternoon, everybody. So our next talk will be by Floortje Schepers. And uh, Floortje Schepers is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And since October 2010, she's working in the Utrecht Medical Division. Uh, she'll be talking about how big data changes healthcare. So please, Floortje. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so my name is Floortje Schepers and I'm head of the Department of Psychiatry at the UMC Utrecht Brain Center. And I want to tell you something about how big data will change healthcare, but I also want to tell you something about our own big data project psychiatry um, at the Department of Psychiatry. I hope you can uh, <laughs> hear me. Um, when talking about big data, it's uh, most of the times it's about um, the volume of data. So the more data you have, um, the bigger it is, and, and, and that's what uh, most people think of uh, big data. However, um, there's much more about big data. It's also about velocity, so the speed that data are collected nowadays using all kinds of wearables and applications. And it's also about variety, so connecting different data from different domains, which creates new insights. Um, and also about uh, veracity, it's something about the truthfulness of data or the validity of data. And people who are, who are a little bit critical about big data always tell you that there's too much noise in big data, there's too much missing data, so you cannot um, create real value from it. But I can plead for the opposite, because if we look at research for the past 20, 30 years, the way we collect data is um, at one point of time. When the patient visits the doctor, we measure blood pressure, we measure all kinds of values, but also we ask the patient to fill in questionnaires. But this is only a snapshot of real life. And with big data and collecting seven days a week for 24 hours a day, um, you can create a vision on real life and real influences of uh, everything you go through as a, as a person. So this is much more valid than the way we do research uh, until now. And with all these different aspects of big data, uh, you can understand that you can create value out of it, which can help us improve healthcare and health processes. The only problem I have with the term big data is that there are a lot of negative associations with it. So um, at our project, we uh, talk about data art. And I hope at the end of this talk, you will understand why I think um, working with big data can be comp compared with art. So what is changing if we um, look at the world around us? We are moving from patients to citizens. Also the um, the, the definition of health by um, uh, Machtelt Huber helps us with that. It focuses on positive health. So not focusing on illness and sickness, but focusing on the person who has to cope with or deal with the problems or symptoms um, he has. Um, so patients want to be in control. They don't want to be a patient and, and um, get the doctor in, um, uh, at the stair. They want to um, be in control themselves. And so the term patient is not um, fit anymore for uh, healthcare nowadays. And also the doctor who was always someone with the knowledge and the skills is now facing a transformation because uh, knowledge is everywhere. It's accessible for all people on the internet. And even for doctors, it's hard to keep up because every day new scientific papers are published and it's, it's too difficult to keep up with all this new knowledge that is created every day. And also the skills are taking over by new technologies and uh, ICT robots and E and M health uh, applications take over the tasks of the doctor. And the third part that is changing is that treatment was always based on randomized controlled trials and is now moving towards uh, a treatment that is based on clinical intelligence. And this is where big data come in. So the motivation for us to start with our project was the huge amount of data and it's increasing, increasingly um, growing faster and faster. So we're not there yet. Um, if you look at this picture, you can see that for 
something simple as the forecast, uh, data are uh, exponentially increasing. And in 2020, we will have lots and lots of zettabytes of data about uh, the forecast. And it's forecasts in healthcare can be compared a little bit with each other because it's very difficult to predict. And the more data you, you have, the more precise your prediction will be. And also the book, I don't know if you know it, by Victor Mayo Schoenberg about the big data revolution described perfectly what big data can change in our world. And this data explosion is, is all already happening in healthcare. Um, if you look at the EBM, the left upper uh, picture, this is the Watson computer. And this computer can diagnose rare diseases more accurately and fast than a panel of the 10 best experts from all around the world. So uh, this computer bases its diagnosis on hundreds and thousands of scientific papers that are on the internet. And we all know, of course, the applications. We carry them with us on our mobile phones or iWatch or whatsoever. And it can monitor our diet, our blood pressure, our steps, our sleep um, every day, 24 hours a day. And there's also this picture of a contact lens that can monitor cortisol levels every minute of the day. And it's, it's something about how your stress level is. And digital tattoos that can measure skin conductance or all kinds of parameters that can tell you something about your health. And drones that can measure the environment, air pollution, noise, crowdedness. And it all influences our behavior. And don't forget Google and Facebook and Twitter. We all thought that we were clients of Facebook and Twitter, but we're not clients. We're products of Facebook and, and Twitter. They collect data of our behavior and they sell those profiles to uh, big organizations who want to sell us clothes or washing machines or whatsoever. And the real challenge is to combine all these data. Because if you have all these data, collected through wearables or applications and we combine that with the data we collect in the hospital using MRI scanning or uh, x-rays or blood um, uh, tests you have the quantified self so the quantified self is um, giving you a view on how we function and if you combine that with the genome data we have now with whole genome sequencing we know all the genome codes that are in our DNA, and these are the building bricks of how we function. And we combine that as well with the exposome. This is a term that was first used by Wilde in 2005, and it's, um, it's more or less the dynamic environment, how it's changing every minute of the day. And we combine that with the microbiome, all the microbes that are in our bowels and in our skin and influence how we function. And if we can analyze this complex interaction, it will give us a completely new view on health and sickness. I don't know if you know this man. This is Peter Higgs. He found the Higgs boson and got the Nobel Prize for it. And it has nothing to do with healthcare, but the project generated so much data that there was an insight that you couldn't store these data in a data warehouse, in a classical data warehouse. You had to store it in unstructured data pools, and they had to find algorithms to um, pick out the, the data they had to use for their analysis at, a, uh, at the right point of time. And also data management was not enough anymore. They needed data scientists who could be, go beyond the classic statistics to calculate on these data and create new insights. So TNO investigated all the hospitals in the Netherlands and they investigated if they were prepared for the future, for all these new uh, possibilities. And what they concluded was that most of the hospitals in the Netherlands are not prepared. Um, they uh, foresee that sensor data, like the digital tattoos and the applications, will have a huge impact on how we organize healthcare. Um, till, until now, doctors or scientists are the owners of the data they collect. But in the future, the patients will be the owners of the data. They collect their own data and they will come to the doctor and ask, it, and ask him or her, 
um, see what's going on inside my body and, and, and how you can help me. So classical statistics is moving to risk profiling and normative models. So these normative models are based on the huge population. So sickness and health is not the opposite anymore. It's just like a house curve. It's, um, it's divided um, among the population and you can plot one individual where he is on the curve. And what you do next is you analyze all these different uh, separated factors together as a complex model. And then you get this risk profile of one patient. And this is what they call big data medicine or P4 medicine because it's predictive. It creates risk profiling, but also chance profiles. It's preventive because you can take action before your symptoms will occur. occur. It's personalized because it's one profile plotted on this norm model of the population and it's participating because you can decide as a patient which data you collect, collect and how you uh, interact with your doctor about it. And it's also, also uh, everything about combining um, domains, combining domains because not only um, we need data from different domains, but we also need different experts. We need beta scientists and we need geoscientists and we even le need linguistics because a lot of data are in text in the personal files of the patient and we can analyze those texts and create value out of that using text mining and machine learning. So if we focus on psychiatry, what do we know about the disturbed mind? We know symptoms in psychiatry are about disturbed cognition, about disturbed emotions, and about disturbed behavior. And we know it has something to do with the functioning of your brain, of course, and it also has to do something with your building bricks, your genes. But for a long time, we couldn't investigate the brain and the genes because we didn't have the tools for that. So we only had these symptoms. So what we did, we created a classification system and it's called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It's very popular, it's like a Bible for psychiatrists. And the first one was published by the American Association of Psychiatry in 1952. And what we did, we clustered symptoms and experts discussed about the cutoff points. And these clusters were given names like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression or autism or whatsoever. And after this classification system was invented, the investigation of the brain developed. But the longer we use this DSM classification system, the more we believe this were real diagnoses, like real sicknesses or disorders of the brain. But when we started to investigate the brain using imaging, how, and this is how we can measure structures in the brain, or using EEG, how we can measure activity in the brain, or brain waves or frequencies, or functional uh, imaging, or PET or SPEC scans who can measure activity during a task, when you do a task in the, in the scanner. What we found out was that all the differences and, and, and different um, structures and function we found in mental illnesses, they didn't stick to the classifications, they were all through these classifications. And we also find sometimes these differences in normal healthy pe people or in siblings. And not all mentally ill patients had those disturbances or differences in the brain. And also genetic investigation um, um, developed. We could create um, a nucleus, we could look at the chromosomes, we could look at the DNA, and with the whole genome sequencing, we could code the complete DNA, DNA so we could see all the genes and look for uh, mismatching genes in mental disorders. And again, we found genes, but we found them in all kinds of classifications. So the genes we found in um, schizophrenia, we also found them in depression and bipolar disorder. And we also found them in healthy siblings or healthy persons who didn't, were de uh, didn't have depression. And not all depressed patients had these defect genes. And we didn't find one single gene for schizophrenia. No, we found hundreds of genes. So it was much more complex than we thought. So this were, was where epigenetics came in. The influence of the environment on the genes. So the environment can switch genes on or off. 
So genes will be activated because of the environment. As you can see in this picture, this is a genetic identical twin. So they have completely the same gene package. But if you look at the phenotype, you see that the environment created a complete different phenotype. You see the similarities, but you also see clearly the differences between those two men. So this brought us to a new theory. Uh, it's called the differential suspectability theory. So it's about vulnerability versus resilience. The same seeds were planted in the ground and they got the same amount of water and the same amount of sunlight. However, the nutrition was different. With the normal nutrition, these plants grew to normal plants, but with deficient nutrition, these plants didn't grow as fast and as good as the normal plants. It's like depressed plants. You can look at it like that. And if you enrich the environment, you create more, if you, you put more nutrition in the ground, more sunlight, more water, these plants will grow even faster and higher and stronger than these normal average plants. So the same genes can be your weakness in one context, but in a different context, it can be your strength. So this was a very new insight in mental illnesses. And this brings me to another exciting evolution, the quantum computer, where normal computers calculate um, and compute using classical bits. So a point in space and time is a zero or a one. This quantum computer uses qubits. So a point in space and time is no longer a static element. It's not a one or a zero. It's, it can be both depending on the context. So if you change the context, this point is no longer a static element. It is a changing dynamic part of the environment. And if we go back to, to my former slide, you can see this point, this qubit, as a feature or gene. And in one context, this gene will lead to schizophrenia, but in another context, it will create brilliance. Like Einstein, he was a brilliant mind, but his son got schizophrenia. So maybe the same genes lead to something completely different in a different environment. So this is how we look at it now. Our brain functioning is a complete, complex interaction and thousands of steps of this process where brain and genes and environment interact and create networks in the brain that will change every minute of the day. Even this conversation is changing your brain in a way. If you're listening or not, <laughs> no matter. Um, so let me uh, go to an another example. If we want to investigate why a car is malfunctioning, we can take pictures of those cars that are malfunctioning and pictures of the cars that drive completely normal. It's like taking a MRI scan of the brain. And we will see more damage in the cars that are malfunctioning, but we also see cars that are not damaged and malfunctioning. And we also see damage in the cars that don't uh, 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 do, do not malfunction. The same if we break down the car in all small particles, like genetic research in human beings. We will find defect particles in the, in the malfunctioning cars, of course we will find them, more than in the not malfunctioning cars, of course, but we also find them in normal driving cars. How come? Well, a car is just a car, and it depends where this car is driving. Is it driving on a Sunday morning on a highway with no other cars around, or is it driving on a winding way through the mountains? It matters. And who's behind the wheel? Is this a very old lady driving 50 kilometers, uh, kilometers an hour, or is it someone who steps on the gas and puts the max out of this car? And it matters what weather it is. Is it raining and are the roads slippery or is the sun shining? So all these aspects play a role in if this car will malfunction or not. So these are the problems we have to overcome in psychiatric research. There's a huge selection bias because severe patients who are wondering 
down the street, being addicted, having no home, are not able to fill in an informed consent, they are not selected for our randomized controlled trials. And patients with a lot of comorbidity, they are not included because they don't stick to the classifications. And brain changes over time. Brain plasticity and adaptation is much fle more flexible than we thought. And also when you grow up, your brain changes. And if you take medicine, it changes your brain. And as I told you, the environment is changing every minute of the day. So it influences on uh, your behavior and your emotions and your cognition. So the gap between all this fundamental research in psychiatry and the final phenotype and who we are and, and how we function is too big. This is where the uh, psychiatry big data project started. And we collaborated with a lot of organizations in the Netherlands, like the uh, Bureau of Statistics of the Netherlands, um, but also the LPGGZ, which is a a uh, platform for patients and family uh, members of patients uh, who will help us create new insights and all other kinds of parties involved. And we have to collaborate, work together to make this uh, project a success. And this is very difficult because a lot of organizations ask us, the first question they ask when I try to involve them is, how's the governance? How's the governance arranged of this project? And this is what we tell them. The governance is like a group of starlings. I don't know if you s saw them in your life, but in the summer you see these starlings flying through the sky and it's really beautiful. It's like a ballet. One minute there's one starling flying uh, ahead and all the others follow and the, the next minute there's another starling and he's going the opposite direction and all the other starlings follow and no one crashes, no one clashes, there's no boss. It just works and it's, it's, they move on the wind and it's, it's really like a ballet. And this is how we try to, to organize the governance of this big data project. And this is how we designed the project. We want to plot one individual patient on three different levels. We want to create normative modeling on national level, on regional level and on local level because it matters if you are uh, submit to the, to the psychi uh, psychiatry ward at the UMC Utrecht, it matters in which room you sleep. If you sleep in the room next to the coffee machine or to the office of the nurses, maybe you will get less aggressive than if you sleep at the end of the row. And if we know the profiles of patients that will respond positive on being next to the coffee machine, we can foresee that and put the right patient in the right room. So on all these levels, we can plot one individual patient and seek for the best treatment and the best diagnose. And this is our analytic um, process, prescriptive analytics. So we go from predictions, from what will happen, when will it happen, and why will it happen. Uh, then we go to decisions. What can we change to make it better? And then we will measure if this has an effect. So this is what we did. We um, organized a few big hackathons. We also organized a lot of small hackathons, but the big hackathons were really fun. We uh, invited data scientists from all over the Netherlands and we let them play with our data. They were anon anonymized, of course, but um, these afternoons, these data scientists with their flip-flops and their hooters came in with their, um, with their laptops and and they were mangled with the doctors with all the boring clothes and, and very serious faces and nurses and managers. And they all created a very um, successful afternoon uh, looking at the data, making sense of it together. And it was very, very um, fruitful because we found a lot of things. And what we learned from these big hackathons is that only small findings can have a huge impact. If we look back at the, the, last, the past 30 years, what genetics and imaging studies changed in the way we work, it is almost nothing. No protocol changed because of all that research, which cost us millions of, of, of euros and dollars. But one small finding can make a huge impact on the treatment of one patient at our ward. So we have to... Um, realize that these are very important um, findings. 
So what we did, we didn't select patients, we just analyzed data of all the patients, real-life patients that came, uh, come to our hospital every year, 2,000 patient, new patients come to our hospital every year, and we analyzed data of the past 10 years, and we didn't look at classifications, we just looked at symptoms through all classifications, and we didn't have any hypothesis. So we let the machine do the work. It was really data-driven intelligence with machine learning and text and data mining. And what we found was, was really surprising. For example, we found that at day five, at the crisis unit, people had a peak in aggression. Patients had a peak in aggression. And we didn't know why, so we looked for the reasons in the patient files. And what we found out was these were patients who were using drugs and alcohol before they were submitted. And they couldn't get out of the war because the doors closed in the crisis unit. So there was a lot of craving at day five. And what we do now, we ask these people, how much do you use? How much cannabis? How much alcohol? Because we have medic medication which can help you go through this fifth day, which is very hard for people who use on a regular basis. And we also found specific profiles of patients that get, got panic attacks during the night. And then we thought, why? Why do they have panic attacks? Because their sleeping medication were short-term sleeping medication, and they didn't work anymore at 4 o'clock in the night. So what we did, we changed the medication schedule and changed the short-acting medication into a long-acting medication. So these people were covered all night. And another very interesting finding, as a warning sign, if the nurses and the doctor write down 150 words or more in the patient file for two days in a row, at the third day there was a chance of over 85% that these patients got aggressive. So it was a very warning sign. We don't know why, but we can use it as a warning sign. And if there's more words than 150 for two days, the nurses can take specific attention for these patients. And well, keep an eye on them and help them through the day. So what we think in the future, um, with all these wearables and all these applications, patients can collect data about their functioning and their life, and they come to the psychiatric ward with a psychiatric fingerprint. So a lot of uh, profiling can already be done before the patients uh, enter our doctor room. So it keeps us from asking about symptoms, clustering these symptoms in diagnosis and looking for the right protocol uh, to match with this diagnosis. It can focus on the real needs of the patients because we don't have to do this diagnosing anymore. It is more precision medicine, personalized medicine. And we can have a conversation about other things that are important for our patients. And if we have these needs, um, if we see these needs more uh, accurately, we can have a personalized diagnosis and a personalized treatment plan together with the patient, which can be very individual. So big data, I think, is about you. It's about one individual in this large pool of unstructured data of life. And this is why I think data art is more sufficient than big data. Maybe it's a woman on the moon, but I, um, I believe in it. And I'm very curious if you have any questions or suggestions or comments on my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Floor. <laughs> Give her a warm hand. So right now, we would like to open the floor for any questions from the audience. Is there any question? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, how do you uh, prevent that uh, you say it's about the people? But how do you prevent if uh, you have this bad database and then somebody comes in, you analyze the data, that it doesn't become a number but stays a person because uh, it saves money, of course, just to say, okay, now it's day five, increase the medication, day six, you can, you know what I mean? How, how can you prevent that uh, from just saving costs? And uh, Yes. Um, maybe it goes easier on the organization, but I'm not sure if it's good for the people, really. Well, I think this really uh, personalized way of looking at patients with a personal profile, risk profile, chance profile, is uh, less a number than it is right now. Because now we categorize patients in 
diagnosing in, in, in diagnostic clusters, but they don't belong there because um, all patients are different. And I think the differences are more uh, dominant than the, the, the similarities between all the patients of, uh, for example, schizophrenia. Uh, they all have the diagnosis of schizophrenia, but if you look at them one by one, they are completely different. They have different complaints, different symptoms, different problems, different needs. And by focusing on your specific profile, I think it becomes more personal. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Yes, in the back. Hello. Very nice talk. Um, I think it's a great idea to combine the, this data with the people that can analyze it. And my question is, have you, are you taking this beyond the hackathons? Are you continuing this? Yes, we are. So the hackathons were just um, to create some vibes in the hospital <laughs> and to, uh, uh, to convince managers that it's, it's good to work this way. But how we do it in practice is that we have all kinds of small hackathons. We have um, a few data scientists working on the data and we invite nurses from the ward and psychiatrists from the ward to look at the data. Um, we have a very nice visualiz uh, visualization tool. It's called Cinescope. I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's really like a dashboard and you can play with the data and, and um, scroll with them and, and see all kinds of correlations popping up. And by discussing this uh, with nurses and psychiatrists, um, we try to create value out of it and then immediately Im uh, implement it on, the daily, um, on a daily basis in the work floor. Yeah. So it's an ongoing process. Great. Any more questions? In the front. Uh, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is, well, uh, you're saying uh, well, you're working with brains. But yes. um, have you looked at, at other, uh, well, applications, other uses? Because, well, my opinion is you can use it everywhere in, in physiology. Yes, you can, yes, <laughs> I you think can about uh, diabetes or, or, or let's yes. say, yeah, yeah, kidney, kidney diseases. And yes, th this is um, the project from the department. Yeah, I think it's a huge op opportunity. <laughs> it is, it is. And, and we try to convince the board of our hospital to use this kind of research, practical research, in other wards as well. So, um, I think next month we will have a workshop with all kinds of departments, uh, neurology, um, uh, I think uh, child and adolescent uh, care, um, uh, radiology, we have all kinds of words um, included and tell us what we're doing and we hope they will copy paste it for their own words because of course it's, it's it, you can use it everywhere on, on every organ you want, yeah. Great. Okay, and, and the other question I have is, what, what do the patients, the patients, okay, let's, the individuals, what do yes. they think about their treatment? Like, well, aren't we used as a number here or being so specific? I mean, well, in psychiatry, our treatments, um, if I say it a little bit, um, well, corte de bocht, we have a, a psychotherapy and we have medication. And we have the same medication now for almost 50 years nothing is really changing and also psychotherapy is not really changing so patients often feel um, not completely understood by, by our treatments and our um, uh, activity plans and, and what we create to help them yes and 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 they really embrace this project we we involve them in in the hackathon sessions and let them look at the data and, and they really enjoy um, how we can look for the themes that are important in their lives, like um, isolation and not being valuable anymore in society and uh, not having a partner or a job. These are themes that are very important for psychiatric patients and we don't ask for that because we only ask for symptoms and then treat them uh, to reduce the symptoms and we forget about all these very important themes. So this can help us with that, I think. I thought we had a question over here, yes? Uh, this is all uh, in the university um, medical sense of Utrecht. Is yes. there anything on national scale which also is happening with 
data, uh, medicines? And yes, there is. Um, uh, we have the Biobank. Uh, so uh, it's an initiative of all the academical hospitals in the Netherlands. And we collect data about the genome there and about tissue. Um, and we also uh, have international collaborations where we collect imaging data. And so there is a lot of um, collaboration going on and using big data. But this is different because it's really clinical. We use the clinical real patient data. And in the Netherlands, as, as far as I know, um, we, some, some hospitals are trying, but it's, it's not really there yet. So yeah. it's... Yeah, that's also a thing I, I, I saw. So that's a very interesting, yes. pioneering way it's of really working pioneering. with, with yes. data. Yes, so. it is. And there's so much to gain in this. Oh, uh, it is. In this there's much to gain. With, what we with know data, now is big just data, and also especially, I think, in, yes. in the medical world. But there are also a, a lot of problems to overcome, like privacy issues. Uh, in, in hospitals, privacy is a very difficult issue to, to tackle. And uh, you don't want these data to um, fall in the wrong hands. And so it's got more difficult. So yes, it's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. Between the walls of the hospital, it's possible. But yeah. when you go outside and you connect external data sources, it becomes more complicated. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we have a lot of lawyers also thinking with us how to, <laughs> how to deal with this problem. Yeah. Great. Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Do you get any resistance from doctors or nurses? I can imagine that not everybody is happy if some algorithm suddenly prescribes what they should do. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking, we, because we get a lot of resistance. But not only from nurses and doctors, the most resistant we get is from researchers because they think this is very scary. They do research now for a long time on a very, uh, in my opinion, old fashioned way by collecting data at one point in time and then two years later again and then matching these data with, with MRI scanners. Um, and they think this is really scary because the patient is in the lead, uh, data of the patients are in the lead um, and you have a different role now, in the, uh, not now, in the future as a researcher. So you have to, to work together, and, and that's for researchers, it's, it's difficult. Because they're used to getting prizes and publications on their name, and this is all about collaboration and working together. So it's not very personal uh, gaining uh, stuff. <laughs> so how do you deal with the resistance? I try to convince them with talks like this and, and show them what's going on in the outside world, because doctors and researchers as well, they tend to focus uh, in, in to the inside and, and not to what is going on in the outside world. It, it, there are not, no doctors here, no, no nurses here. So I try to, to open the windows and the doors and tell them, look outside. And if we don't want Google to dictate our, re our healthcare in a few years, we have to do something with these um, uh, developments and, and these uh, technical possibilities. Maybe so to add on that, uh, do you think there's resistance coming from uh, the management of uh, uh, hospitals? Not so much, but on the other hand, if you uh, ask them to invest in, for example, data scientists, because we don't have them in the hospital, and I tell them you need to, to have those ki people who, who think in, in, in that kind of uh, uh, bits and bytes and, and whatever, um, they are... Um, not convinced very easily. So they think we have our ICT people and we have our statistics, so we can manage with those. Um. All right, any more questions from the audience? If not, I would again like to thank you very much. We have a small gift for you. Ah, thank you. And again, please give her a warm hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for showing up.